Hi, welcome to this uh, episode of Higher Dimensions. My name is Aaron Tomlinson. I want to thank you for joining me once again. I'm back. Hopefully, I have improved my video quality from the things that I'm doing at home. Uh, if you'd take a minute, I'd sure love it if you'd subscribe to my channel and uh, hit the notification button so that you'll get notifications when I put out new videos. And now that we are, uh, most of us around the world and definitely around the country and definitely where I'm at, we're in uh, shelter in place because of the COVID-19 and the coronavirus. And so hopefully I'll have more time to make videos like these. Right now in this video, what I wanna talk about is, uh, I was gonna say today, but I guess you could be watching it at night. So that's why the hesitation. But I wanna talk about the nature of God and what is the nature of God. And for most of us, if we came from a Judeo-Christian background at all, and the United States predominantly, is influenced at least in our consciousness from Judeo-Christian ideas. Most people think of God as being out there somewhere, as being in the sky, uh, being in heaven, being somewhere separate and other than us. A lot of places and a lot of uh, wonderful people have gotten the revelation that Christ is within us, whether they refer to Christ as Christ or as the Holy Spirit or just spirit in general. There is this growing awareness in our consciousness that God is both imminent and transcendent. But from the Judeo-Christian background, we primarily relate to the male aspects of deity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we have a tendency to think that God is, like I said, out there somewhere. And so there's a lot of people praying right now because of the worldwide crisis that we're in. Um, there's a lot of concepts and ideas about prayer and about how God relates to us about life after death that maybe aren't entirely accurate. And I surrendered the idea of God being the old man in the sky uh, quite a while ago. And I've had several questions about, well, if God is not this being that sits on a throne up there somewhere in the sky, then what exactly is the nature of God? And so I'm gonna attempt to tackle that in this video. So one thing in studying mysticism, and I've been studying mysticism for 20 years, and it doesn't matter whether it's Christian mysticism, Jewish mysticism, Sufi mysticism, or even those that come from Eastern uh, places like India and China, there's one thing that they all have in common uh, when they talk about the nature of God. And the one thing that they say is that God is no thing, that God in God's truest self cannot be expressed in any form, any word, any name, or any metaphor, that God simply is. It's interesting because even in the Judeo-Christian background, when Moses meets God at the burning bush, he gives him his name and he says, I am, and he doesn't finish the sentence. Basically, he says, I am all, all that is. I am being. Quantum physicists have stumbled into this, at least some of them have, <clears throat> and I don't wanna go into the quantum physics aspect of this because it's really not my area. But uh, you can look at various ones that have won Nobel Peace Prize, or Nobel Peace, Nobel Prizes for their uh, contributions. And they will say that there is a, there appears to be a consciousness that is observing the universe, that there is a, an intelligence that is running everything. And one of the, premier physicist says this intelligence or this consciousness is the mind of God. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is in uh, one of the cities in Greece, Athens. He's in Athens. And he's looking at all the idols that they had made to represent the various gods that they worshiped. And he found a God that had no name or a God that was unknown. And he pointed them to the unknown God. And he said, this is the God that we are all the offspring of, and in him we live and move and have our being. So if we're going to begin to talk about the nature of God, we've got to understand that God is, is everywhere, that God is the, the life essence, the being in which we live and move and breathe and have our own being, and everything else that exists. So God certainly in my view, is omnipresent in the sense that he is everywhere. He is being, uh, God is life, and that includes our own being. So at the core of our essence and our being and who we are, we are also expressions, each one of us, every single human being, of the divine. And this is what it means to be made in the image of God. 
but God also wants to be related to and wants to be understood. And so there is this condescending of God that in Christian circles we call the incarnation, where God takes on form and name so that in this level of consciousness that we find ourselves, this particular stage of our evolution, we are able to communicate with, understand, and relate to this divine presence that is beyond all, that is in all, and that transcends all. And so uh, we can give form to God through our thoughts, through metaphors, through archetypes. And I think where God begins to take form for us is at that level of archetypes. Now, archetypes are things in the collective human consciousness that we all have in common. Messiah, or Christ, is certainly an archetype. It's the archetype of a hero. It's the archetype of a rescuer. It is the archetype of a king or of a savior that uh, we relate to from the Christian perspective as being Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the one that came to save us from our sins, the one that came to rescue us. But you'll find this archetype of the hero and the savior in every culture, regardless of the time period that that culture existed, and regardless of the location that that culture existed upon earth. Everyone has hero stories. And so God can begin to emerge in various different archetypes. These archetypes then begin, at the more we begin to define what God is using these archetypes, then God takes another step down and we begin to relate to God through symbols, through metaphors, and through uh, ideas, and through words. But I want to be clear, these are uh, symbols, metaphors, and these archetypes are things that we give. It's what we contribute to the process. They are things that exist inside of our own consciousness that God sort of clothes God's self with so that, again, at this level of consciousness, we can have relationship. Now, there's two primary divisions in the archetypes, and that is masculine and feminine, which makes sense because uh, that's the basic division, at least biologically, of every human being that's ever been born on the planet. Um, for the most part. There are biological exceptions, but most of us are immersed in this idea of male and female. So our arch archetypes take on those various different energies. In the Western world and in Christianity, we relate to God primarily through a male archetype, as I said earlier, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is not in, a, in and of itself a bad thing, but it does cut us off completely from the feminine energies or the feminine archetypes that the divine may wish to express the divine self with. This is a problem that we have uniquely uh, through the last few thousand years or a couple thousand years, <clears throat> with, particularly in monotheistic religions. Uh, older, more ancient cultures had goddesses. They had feminine clothing, if you will, or an understanding of feminine archetypes and energies that they used to relate to the feminine aspects of God. And I think it's tragic that for most of us in the Western world, we have lost this divine feminine archetype and this divine feminine relationship. And I think it's one of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, that God is beginning to restore, that, that needs to be restored to humanity in order for us to come into a greater level of understanding about God, about the energies that we relate to that are divine energies and our own divine consciousness and personality, particularly for women. And I think, I, I think it's directly related. The oppression that we see of women in Judeo-Christian uh, religions, in the three Abrahamic religions, for sure, Judaism, Christianity, and um, Islam. <laughs> almost forgot that one. So we see a general oppression of women in these places. Still today, there are places, there are churches that exist in, in America in the 21st century where women are not allowed to hold leadership positions, where they're not allowed to teach unless they have a husband or some kind of a male covering. And we talk a lot in various different circles about fathering, but we don't talk a lot about mothering. And so we're missing that feminine divine archetype. So one of the ways, one of the other ways that we give form to God is through God's divine names or attributes that we assign to divinity itself. One that comes to mind that's probably on everyone's mind right now is that of healing. 
in the Bible, one of the names that's given to God is Yahweh Rapha or Jehovah Rapha or the Lord, our healer. But healing is a concept or a thought form that we create, that we use then to clothe the divine healing essence or that God uses to clothe God's own divine healing essence in order to channel it to us in a way that we can understand and in a way that we can connect with it by faith and experience the healing presence and the healing power of God. So two things that we need to look at when we're giving form to the divine, we, we need to understand that we're the ones that give form and likeness to the divine. And then the divine chooses to put on those thoughts and those images and those metaphors in a way that he or she or the divine can be relatable to us. Now, here's the problem where thought forms come in. Uh, what's a thought form? A thought form is anything that we give a lot of attention and a lot of energy to and a lot of emotion to in our minds that really does take on an existence within our minds and can collectively take on existence within the human consciousness. Now, the more people who are thinking the same thought, the more people who are investing the same amount of emotion into a thought form, the stronger and the greater that thought form becomes. And so a lot of the ways that we understand God and that we relate to God are God forms, or one teacher I heard call it a deific mask, a way that we conceptualize God, that God's essence and energy then abides within and is transmitted to us. I know I keep repeating that, but I really want to make sure that my viewers and listeners get the point. So over the years, the more people that invest devotion, the more people that invest allegiance into a particular God form or deific mask, the stronger that form becomes. And then the problem becomes when we confuse the thought form with God's divine essence or God's divine nature. So you've always been an expression of the divine. You've always been an extension of God. You've always had God within. But most religions will try to tell you that you need to worship a deific mask or a deific thought form or a God thought form that is outside of yourself. Now, this can become somewhat problematic for us when we are told that that God has to come and inhabit us. So if you go to a particular revival meeting that's held by a group, let's just use Christianity as an example. Let's say that there is a Christian church that is a charismatic church, and they participate on a greater level of collective agreement with other charismatic Christians about what the nature of God is is like. God is spirit. God is outside of you. God comes to inhabit you. You are sinful. You are detestable to God. You are somehow unacceptable to God as a human being. You were born that way. And then they dictate through thought forms of legalism what particular uh, actions or beliefs or expressions of yourself that you may be doing that doesn't fit with their particular idea or collective agreement of righteousness or godliness or what God is like. And so they may tell you that God is holy, that God is just, and that God does not accept sinners, that God is outside of you, that God is judging you, that God is angry at you, and that somehow you need to do something to become right with God. And they're able to convince you of this message while you're attending this meeting, and they invite you forward to pray a prayer to invite their God, their Jesus thought form into yourself. Now, remember, these things are real. They exist in the realm of consciousness, but that doesn't mean that they're not real. So when you go forward and you invite that God, that version of Jesus, that version of the Holy Spirit, whatever, into your heart, you are literally welcoming their thought form, their deific mask to become a part of yourself that wasn't previously. <clears throat> So you'll invite that God into your heart. And when you invite that God into your heart, that's exactly what you're doing. You're inviting the thought form. You're inviting the parameters by which human beings through collective consciousness have put around God to describe what they think God is like. So if that God uh, deems a certain thing a sin and detestable to God, the moment you receive that um, energy, that essence of the divine coming in those clothes into yourself, 
immediately from within yourself, if you go out and engage in those activities, you will feel what we call conviction, or you will feel like you are displeasing God. Then if you continue with that particular group, they will disciple you, which means that they will, uh, disip in a disciplined way, they will invite you to pattern your thinking, your feeling, your behaving, your actions to whatever form they believe that God is following. And the more you devote to that, the more energy you're actually giving to that particular thought form. And the more that thought form will begin to control your life. And so that's why so many of us right now are, are <clears throat> experiencing deconstruction because we are in a different age. The ages have changed. Things will never go back to the way they were. We can only go forward. And there are things that we can bring with us from the old age, and there are things that won't come with us in the old age. <clears throat> so those of us that are making the transition in consciousness, we're finding that those old thought forms from the previous age no longer serve us and are not part of the new that is trying to emerge. And so those thought forms are being deconstructed from our lives. And that is a very volatile process for many of us, depending on how much devotion you gave to it. If you gave a lot of devotion to a particular version of Christ, to a particular version of the divine, then you're going to have to struggle against being disobedient or unfaithful or unloyal to those thought forms, even though there's revelation coming to you that's showing you that the divine really doesn't fit those patterns. And there's probably no other place that this is uh, more volatile for us than when we start talking about the divine feminine. A, a while back, I posted on my Facebook page some things about the divine feminine being in exile. And what I mean by that is that the feminine archetypes have been exiled or divorced from our concept of the divine. And I believe that those archetypes are being reawakened in the age in which we live. And we need to find new forms and new expressions through which the divine feminine can come and communicate and relate to us. And when I posted these posts, man, did people start coming out and saying, God transcends gender. God doesn't have genitalia. God doesn't, you know, wh whatever because you're bringing up the divine feminine. Now, all that's true. Obviously, I'm saying God transcends all of that. But here's my question. Where were those voices about God doesn't have genitalia and God doesn't have gender when all we had were masculine archetypes and those masculine archetypes are all we continue to use? You can go to churches around the world and people worship God as father. They worship God as judge of the earth. They worship God as king. They worship Jesus as the hero and as the Messiah. And you'll notice that all of those things are male archetypes. You start trying to bring in any kind of female archetypes and talk about God as mother or talk about God as nurturer or talk about God as the womb of creation that gives birth, uh, then immediately people freak out. And they're freaking out because they've accepted only the divine masculine energies. On the flip side of that, there are people who recognized early on, or better than some of us, that, that God wasn't only male, and, and they went into other forms of spirituality and metaphysics, and oftentimes they want to embody the feminine energies of God, which is a beautiful and a wonderful thing, but they overreact, and by only receiving the divine feminine forms, they react against the divine masculine forms and masculine energy. And I think the right path and the best path for us going forward is to be able to blend these archetypes together. So what do we do with all this? Here's what I'm saying. God will not really be able to relate to us at our level of consciousness if we don't put a thought form or a God form to the divine. But we need to understand it's just a costume that the divine energy is wearing in that moment. So if there were certain aspects of the divine that you related to in the past that were helpful for you, for me, again, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, my healer, the divine healer, uh, all that name does is it taps into centuries, millennia of people who have used that name and used that thought form to channel and to release the divine healing presence to humanity. So I have no problem relating to or worshiping God or calling upon God by the divine name Jehovah Rapha. I have no problem with God as uh, provider. I have no problem with God as father. 
but I don't want to be limited there either. I want to be able to know God as mother. I want to be able to know God as the divine presence that transcends all forms. Now, there are other thought forms that aren't helpful. When we think of God as this ugly, judgmental person who can't stand people because of their sexual orientation or because uh, religion, thought, religious thought forms have told us that certain things were unclean, those things have served their purpose and they're over, they're done. We don't have to let those things rule in our hearts and minds. You can deconstruct from those things and you don't have to become an atheist and you don't have to throw out the parts of your faith that were working for you. You can hold on to the things that are working for you. You can keep using those things as tools to relate to the divine, but you can also allow your consciousness to be expanded. You can flush out these ideas of God as being a judge, of God as being this ancient king that sits on a throne somewhere that you have to pray and cry out to and hope somehow that God will have mercy and turn back plagues and turn back wars. Uh, you, you don't have to be subjected to those thought forms and those beliefs. It is okay to allow those things to go and be deconstructed and at the same time, hold on to the things that are working for you. Now, perhaps you find yourself at a place, you're trying to understand who God is and you're trying to understand the nature of God. Maybe you don't have thought forms and belief forms that you're having to uh, reject and get out of yourself. And I hope this video will be helpful for you too that you can begin to relate to God through thought forms, through deific masks, but let your inner witness always be your guide in these things. If something doesn't feel right, listen to that voice inside that says that doesn't feel right. If something doesn't sound right, listen to that voice that says it doesn't sound right. Now, it could be something, you may hear something that could be a blessing to you or helpful for you, that doesn't sound right, that doesn't give you peace, that, that you get a check inside yourself. And that can simply be because the thought form that's coming to you is conflicting with those old thought forms. So what I would say in that situation is that when you get uncomfortable with something, when you hear something that doesn't register with you, you don't have to accept it right away. It's not even healthy to accept it right away, but you might wanna take some time and spend some time meditating on it, thinking about it, and doing some more research on it, and always, always, always try to ask yourself the question, what's gonna be the end result if I receive and act on this belief? Take your time with these things. Man, we have, a lot of us have time right now. We have time to give to spiritual work. We have time to give to self-improvement. It's like the whole world is on pause, and there's a reset button, and all of us have too much time on our hands, and it's a good time to go within. It's a good time to think about your belief systems and who you've been, and maybe take this time to sort of reevaluate things and reinvent yourself. So I hope this was somewhat helpful to those of you that have asked questions about the nature of God. Uh, please comment in the comments below whether you agree with my take or not, and let me know what you think. And uh, as always, I hope wherever you're at, I hope it's great for you. I know we're in a tough time, but I believe we'll pull through it. I'll be doing some more videos on these. Again, if you haven't subscribed to my channel uh, and this has helped you, maybe check out some of the other videos and see if you like them. And then give me a subscribe and hit the notification button and give me a like. Thank you once again. This is Aaron Tomlinson and you're watching Higher Dimensions. Thank you for joining me and God bless you.